All right, everyone, let's go uh, back on the record then. Mr. Means, you were in your direct examination of Dr. Newton. You can continue with your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. And, I, and I'll try to work efficiently here to get through this. Uh, Dr. Newton, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, paragraph 50 on page 13. Okay. You reference four lines down. You say to suggest to a witness that the witness not submit to an interview by opposing counsel. Uh, and before that, you reference that it would be improper for a prosecutor or defense counsel to do so. Is that applicable in this situation? So there are two implications, I think, in this ABA standard, which, um, which is the first is that we shouldn't be treating, neither side should treat witnesses as partisans. And witnesses' jobs are to relate the facts and not to take a side or be on one, one position or another. And so that's an aspirational or an aspirational a standard, uh, an ethical standard, I think, that is problematic here. And then it, it feels to me like the prosecutor in this uh, commentary with Ms. Shiflett is um, suggesting that she not cooperate with, um, by implication, with defense counsel. It's not said explicitly, don't talk to defense counsel, but defense counsel doesn't know what he's doing. He's never handled a felony. You know, he doesn't have much experience. All this type of stuff is acting in, in effect to discourage the witness from cooperating with defense counsel, which is against, I mean, which is against these standards. I think you make a reference not to treat witnesses as partisans. Would, would you in your expert opinion, say in this interview, this discussion, that Summer was treated as a partisan for the prosecution's case? I wouldn't say that. I okay. would say no. Okay. Uh, paragraph 53 on page 14. On the second line after the quotation there in parentheses, you say prosecutors have the ability by their choice of language to telegraph to the witness specific facts that the, pro that the prosecutor wants the witness to say. In your professional opinion, did Mr. Wood telegraph specific facts to Summer Shiflet? I think the whole interview is Mr. Wood's recitation of facts. Thank you. Let's go to uh, paragraph 56 on page 15. And actually, let me go down to page, uh, paragraph 57. The first line where you cite State versus Sanchez appears to be an Idaho appellate court case, 2005. Prosecutors can commit misconduct when they particularly with a jury use a person's religious belief to imply that they are more or less credible. Now there's been some previous testimony regarding uh, implicating one's religious beliefs or whatnot in a case. And I believe the prior testimony was if you do that in front of a jury, in your opinion, that's potential, that, that is misconduct, not a lot of question or wiggle room. Would you agree with that? Correct. Okay, in this one, it, it says, particularly with a jury, but would you agree that this line does not limit prosecutorial misconduct when using a person's belief to become more or less credible to just the standard of in front of a jury? So, if you want to read the line, that might help. The, the first um, line there, paragraph 57. Correct, yeah, I've read the line. I'm not sure I understand the question. So. Okay, so the previous testimony is my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, was discussing the use of religious beliefs in witnesses in front of a jury. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, your testimony was, there's not a lot of wiggle room not to find that misconduct. Would you agree? Correct. If, you're, if you are in front of a jury telling someone because this person is Catholic, they're a liar. That's a classic prohibited. Sure. Issue. This line from Sanchez puts in, in the middle of the sentence in, in commas, particularly with a jury. But I read that line as it is not required, according to Sanchez, that a prosecutor find misconduct when he invokes religious beliefs to be more or less credible. Would you agree with that? Um, I, I don't want to overstate Sanchez. And I, I did review it as part of, of drafting this declaration. But unfortunately, I can't remember what Sanchez says. Um, 
I mean, <coughs> my recollection is, excuse me, <coughs> Sanchez is a, jur is a jury case and a jury misconduct case. So I think it would be tough to take Sanchez out of that context of a jury. Okay. W would you agree in your expert opinion or would you state in your expert opinion after listening to the recording and reading the transcript that Mr. Wood in his comments regarding his religious belief and association, uh, LDS speak, these type of language, that this was an attempt to appeal, appear more credible to the witness? Your Honor, I'm going to object for speculation. I'll, I, I'll sustain that objection. Uh, well, I, I guess, well, let, let me, in your expert opinion, uh, Dr. Newton, um, why would the use of a commonality of religious belief be a part of this conversation? It shouldn't be. Right. Um, and it shouldn't be part of the trial proceedings. And it doesn't violate the rules of professional conduct. No, but we're, we're pushing into rule 610 of the rules of evidence, which are that we shouldn't be using religious beliefs uh, for credibility determinations. And so you're, you're potentially influencing the future testimony of a witness and, and using, you know, this, it just really shouldn't be part of the discussions. Okay, thank you. If, if we go to page uh, 16, paragraph 58, you cited Idaho Supreme Court case. And in there, that it appears that that court case talks about the responsibility of the prosecuting attorney. Correct. It, calls them a quasi judicial put acting in a quasi judicial capacity. Correct. Would you agree in your review of the Idaho rules of professional responsibility that the prosecutor is subject to all of the rules, just like a civil attorney to the Idaho rules of professional responsibility? Is that a yes? Yes. And there's specific rules in addition to in the Idaho rules of professional responsibilities that a prosecutor has to comply with, correct? Correct. And I think I even laid that out toward the front of my declaration of the uh, Idaho rules, I mean, specifically it's um, layout uh, 3.8, mm, there's my memory, but 3.8 is a provision that applies specifically to prosecutors. They have additional ethical guidelines. And I, I point that out to my students pretty frequently, which is the, the drafters of the rules of professional conduct have, have felt very strongly recognizing this common law principle that the Idaho Supreme Court recognized 120 years ago, which was that prosecutors carry a, you know, a, a mantle greater, it's attorney plus. Not only are you just an attorney and bound by these ethical rules, you have greater rules that you are supposed to not be, not be the one that's like choosing a side. You're supposed to be independent, looking at the evidence and actually making decisions to dismiss cases. That's where a prosecutor's greatest power is in not over influencing witnesses, making sure justice is done in a case and not becoming a partisan. And it's, it's, it's a very, very important responsibility that was, is grounded in the common law, but also in the rules of professional responsibility. Thank you. Uh, page 17, paragraph 60. Um, you state, while the prosecutor here did not expressly threaten to charge Mrs. Shiflett or even told her she was not a person of interest, he put pressure on her in other ways to give testimony that would implicate Daybell, and then it goes into particular. When you say Daybell there, I assume you're in reference to Chad Daybell. Is right. that correct? So again, we have another instance of pressure that we discussed earlier. Correct. Okay. Paragraph 62. Yes. You, you make reference in the second line to pretrial taint hearings. Correct. Uh, how, uh, could you explain how that applies here? Yeah, so I, I mentioned this earlier. I testified about this, but this is, this is definitely something among scholars, law professors like me who talk about that this is a way to address some of these problems, which is to have a pretrial 
taint hearing. Um, that's where the court evaluates the credibility of the witness and if the witness has been tainted, if her testimony has been improperly influenced. Um, and it has some backing in courts. And I, I searched in Idaho and there's at least, the Supreme Court at least countenance that type of a remedy. Um, and I'm looking at the affidavit now, but it just, it says that it's the Severson case um, where the, the witness went to lunch with a prosecutor and there was allegations of impropriety that the prosecutor improperly coached the witness and the court countenanced the, the trial court's use of a pretrial taint hearing. Well, actually mid trial in this case, but a taint hearing to kind of uh, assess whether the witness's testimony had been affected. Okay, thank you. If, you switch, if you'll turn to page 18, paragraph 65, you cite the ABA standards. Yeah. Um, you state that the prosecutor should not discourage or obstruct communication between witnesses and the defense counsel. Um, in, 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 is it your expert opinion that uh, Mr. Wood has potentially obstructed communication between the witness and defense counsel? At a minimum, it feels like there's discouraging communication. And again, it's not express, don't talk to defense counsel, but the but defense counsel is not credible and is not acting in your sister's best interests. Um, that would, in effect, I think, discourage most people or in its attempt to discourage, it feels like. Would you agree that it obstructs communication? It could, it could. It would depend on if the witness feel, I mean, the witness would have to um, feel like they couldn't. And there, there's a whole litany of cases. I mean, I talk about these in my classes. There's a litany of cases where prosecutors have obstructed witnesses access to defense attorneys and say, you know, if you talk to this person, I'll do that. And that's where that really crosses that line of, you know, you, you talk to this person, I'm going to come after you. Um, and that really is problematic. This is much more muted than that. Line 66, starts off there with during trial. You see that? Yes. It is misconduct for the prosecution to make personal attacks on defense counsel. Putting right. aside the during trial, is there any question in your mind that the prosecution uh, through his, his negative comments regarding counsel had engaged in a personal attack on defense counsel in front of this witness? Yeah, it's misconduct in trial for sure. But my, my question is take it outside of trial, put the, put the trial setting aside, his comments regarding counsel to defend to uh, this, this witness, would you classify that as, in your expert opinion as a personal attack on defense counsel? Yes, I would call it a personal attack on defense counsel, sure. Your Honor, I have no further questions, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Evans, cross-examination. Your Honor, thank you, I'll be sure. Um, Professor Newton, just just to make sure, and I've, I've looked at what you've you've said in your briefing, but there is a very big difference between what occurs at trial and what occurs pre-trial. Is that correct? Yes. And and I, I don't see anything in your document that isn't something that occurs prior to trial. All of it is what occurs in trial. Am I reading that correctly? I wouldn't say so. No. Um, clear, you have the appellate court stepping in and saying clear misconduct and certain things happen at trial, but that doesn't mean all these rules of professional responsibility and all these other things can't be violated pre-trial or that the constitution can't be implicated pre-trial. But the cases that you cite, all of them that I looked at are all during trial. Correct. That, I, I'm not aware of, at least in my research, I didn't see it an Idaho case. Now I limited my search to Idaho, but of courts addressing this pre-trial, but I, I know that this, this problem happens pre-trial. It's not just limited to that scenario. Right. And Professor Newton, we don't have any evidence that Ms. Schifflet changed her story at this point. Is that correct? I, I can't even go that far. I don't know what Ms. Schifflet testified about anything. 
And, and would you agree with me that at no time did Mr. Wood say, Ms. Shifflett, you will testify to X, Y, and Z, whatever that is? No, I, he told her to tell the truth, but I would say that there is a, definitely a pushback on that. Um, but he did, he did not expressly tell her to lie, if that's the question. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Mr. Pryor, do you have any cross-examination in light of that? I'm going to be extremely brief as well. Uh, Dr. Newton, would you think that it's commonplace for a recording to surface about a prosecutor uh, having a, uh, a discussion with a witness? Is this a scenario that would come up regularly? No, I, I, I hate to maybe put it this way, but it's like you got caught. Okay, and that's why we're here today, because Mr. Wood got caught, right? What it feels like. It's very uncommon. Objection. What's yeah. the objection, Judge? Speculation and testifying that Mr. Wood got caught. Uh, I'll overrule on those grounds. So Mr. Wood got caught, and this sort of scenario is not commonplace, is it? No. Um, I mean, the reason we have Supreme Court cases about prosecutorial misconduct in front of juries is because that uh, that appears and happens when everybody's watching, right? Correct. And when no one's watching and a prosecutor engages in this, the only way to catch him is through finding a uh, recording that he did this. Would you agree with that? So I think maybe the best way for me to qualify this is say, you know, I practiced law for a long time. I've represented thousands of defendants. I've worked on both sides of the aisle. Um, rarely in my experience does a prosecutor record an interview with a witness for, for, and so number one, there just aren't recordings, generally speaking. Um, that's not provided to defense counsel as part of discovery. Now, contrary to that, uh, detectives frequently record there, you know, and police officers do. And so um, in answer, I think to the question is if this stuff is happening, it's because it's not being recorded and it's not, we're not able to see it happening because there's just, it's just not there, but it's the rare case that a recording surfaces and then we can talk about the problems that are happening that we observe. Them. Nothing else, Judge, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Means, any redirect? It, it, taking the totality of the circumstances, Dr. Newton, uh, in your professional expert opinion, is it more problematic for this case moving forward to allow Mr. Wood to continue to represent the state or for him to be disqualified? Your Honor, I'll object to that. It calls for a legal conclusion and a speculation for the court to decide, not Professor Newton. I'll sustain the objection that it does call for legal conclusion. Thank you, Your Honor, no question. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Newton, before we uh, finish your testimony, I, I did have a question. You testified that you were aware of cases where a prosecutor had been disqualified, and I'd like a little more clarification of that. Have you, are you aware of any cases where a sitting trial judge in a, in a pending case pre-trial has removed a prosecutor. I am sorry, sorry. Where's my dogs? Hold on. <laughs> we have the mailman show up, so the dogs have to make sure they don't, dog and then they don't like him. <laughs> Um, am I aware of cases where what? <clears throat> where a, uh, a sitting trial judge in a case pre-trial has ordered a prosecutor to be removed from the case? No, no, Your Honor. I am not aware of any where that's happened. Okay, thank you. That was the only question I had. Thank you, Dr. Newton. Uh, that'll conclude your testimony then. So you can be excused and go ahead and uh, log off of the hearing. Thank you. All right, Mr. Pryor, do you have any additional witnesses to call? No, to? Judge, that's all for the defense. Thank you. All right, Mr. Means, do you have any witnesses you'll be calling in support of your motion? No, Your Honor. All right, and will the state be calling any witnesses in opposition? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, counsel, here's, here's kind of where we are. We've taken a lot of testimony today. It's 4.30. I was kind of sitting where 
we were. My, I'd like to get this issue resolved quickly, but I would also like to allow time for the parties to prepare their final closing arguments on these motions, given the volume of testimony we received. So I'm going to make a suggestion, feel free to weigh in, but I'd like to continue the hearing for a final argument, assuming there's no more testimony being submitted. And I have, <clears throat> I have some availability tomorrow morning and all day Friday as an option, if we can squeeze that in this week. I know there's a lot of calendaring to hear, consider here, but um, is council gonna be available at any of those times to do that? Your Honor, let me go grab my calendar real quick. All right. Your Honor, just for the record, uh, I, I'm available Friday, but not Thursday. Okay, thank you. And I can do in the morning if that, if that works or the afternoon, whatever works for the court. Judge, I can bounce uh, uh, some obligations around Friday morning if necessary to allow for closing argument. I, I have no idea how long that's gonna take, but I would imagine based on the, what we've gone through that it's going to take a little bit of time. Okay. Uh, so Mr. Evans, where we're kind of at is both counsel are available Friday morning and the court is as well. I, I, I need to, I also need to check with Fremont County. Um, Madam Clerk, is there any issue with us Friday morning? Having another no problem. no problem here, Judge. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, I, I have a, uh, a contempt matter, a compel matter, and then also a mediation that morning, but I can work something in Friday afternoon. Okay. Uh, that works for me as well. Is that on, available on your schedules, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Means? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, could we uh, start that right at one o'clock, Mr. Evans? Did you hear? Yes, okay. I am. Your Honor, yes, that should that should be okay. okay. Appreciate your accommodations on that. Um, so unless there's nothing further to bring up this afternoon, then we'll be in recess. We'll continue the matter for the closing arguments of the uh, all parties. Your Honor, can I bring up one thing? Yes. Um, would the court be willing to consider a briefing um, on this? And the reason why I say that is uh, we, we just received these documents that were talked about today just a couple of days ago. Um, I think that it would benefit the court. Um, we, we see the end where the defense wants to go. They want to get rid of Mr. Wood as the prosecutor but I don't see the path that's been laid on how to do that. And so some standards um, for the court to look at, um, we, we'd be prepared to offer the court briefing. In fact, even summarize our argument in the briefing if the court wants, uh, but the state would require, unless, unless the court is happy to do all that research itself, but uh, we're, we're here to assist. Judge, I'm opposed to doing a briefing. Uh, all I see is a, uh, a delay I'm concerned that uh, uh, they have an opportunity to review these things and can make their argument and present the case law that they think is applicable. As far as Mr. Evans' uh, um, representation that he doesn't see a path to this, uh, I strongly disagree. I see a highway to this. Uh, and quite honestly, I think oral argument would be the preference for me. Uh, in the event the court decides to disqualify Mr. Woods, we can move on with some serious pending matters before the court. If the court decides to go otherwise, we still have some serious pending matters to address. And my view is that a briefing is merely just a delay. Uh, Mr. Daybell has had to incur the cost of this by no fault of his own, a significant cost. And briefing is only going to elevate that cost. All right, Mr. Means, anything you'd like to add on the suggestion? Yeah, briefly. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I, I have to agree with Mr. Pryor and reiterate what he said. I think the the opportunity for briefing was was when this motion was noticed everybody knew what the issue was everybody knew what the accusation was everybody had a copy of the recording there were no surprises there there are plenty of opportunities to do legal briefing or analysis or presentation to the care the court today why in previous memorandums or additional declarations and they chose not to do that 
if the court entertains that idea, it's a substantial co cost to my client. I think it's unnecessary. It's going to prolong this issue. I would definitely obviously request for an opportunity to time to respond to their briefing because there was no argument presented other than cross-examination today. I have no idea what they're going to argue. There's no additional testimony other than what's been presented to the court. We would need adequate time to respond. And now we're talking about several weeks in order to resolve this when we've already pushed off multiple motions in order to accommodate this hearing. So I'd agree with Mr. Pryor that the uh, that the briefing is not allowed. Closing arguments on Friday tomorrow should be sufficient. There's nothing that stops opposing counsel from arguing tomorrow on what the standard should be in his closing argument and the things that he cited. And again, this motion has been noticed for quite some time now and everyone, there's no surprises here. All right. Um, well, I've, I've considered the request and really for the reason that I think this is an issue that does need to get resolved in an expeditious matter. Uh, I do want to get the answer to this done uh, sooner than later. Briefing is going to extend that. And as the parties have mentioned, we've got other motions we bumped off, including the motion to change venue and the motions to dismiss, which still need to be scheduled. In light of all that, uh, I'll deny the request for the briefing to uh, I won't deny the request for briefing. If you want to have any briefing submitted, and I know this puts you on a very tight timeline, um, but it would need to be submitted by Friday at one o'clock uh, on the 8th when we have the uh, continuation of this hearing. Um, so you're free to submit anything. It doesn't even need to be all that formal if you have some certain cases you'd like to cite or lay out. I've done some research already. I don't know that there's really a whole lot of precedent out there to get into on this specific issue, but I'll leave that for the parties to argue as well. Any citations you want to include in your argument or submit those prior, you can just uh, do that on this shortened time frame. I'll just consider oral closing arguments and any briefing you want to uh, submit between now and Friday, and then we'll get this matter concluded uh, by the end of this week. So that'll be the ruling for today on that motion, and then we will continue on with uh, the hearing at one o'clock on the 8th of January. Well, that will also be by Zoom. We'll send the notices out. Uh, Council, I appreciate the way you've conducted yourselves today in the hearing. And if there's nothing further for this afternoon, then we'll be in recess. Thank, Thank you. you.